Osborne. Tonight, we're going to have a great show on the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain broadcast. It is 2018, so I wanted to say Happy New Year to all of you. We haven't been on in a few weeks uh, from vacation, so Happy New Year, and I hope so far that it's coming along really, really great for you and all of your health goals. And uh, I want to make sure that, um, that those of you that are tuning in tonight can hear me. So if, as you're tuning in, if you can hear me, just type it into your box there. Let me know that you can hear me. Click the yes button. Click the like. Chime in. Let me know where you're from. Let me know where you're tuning in from in the world so that we can begin tonight's conversation and, uh, and talk a little bit. We've got a great topic of conversation tonight. Many of you, I'm certain, are probably going into uh, an era of the new year where you've got some type of New Year's resolution where you're basically where you're pushing to try to improve your health or pushing to try to improve something in your life, this New Year's resolution, as so many people do. And uh, so tonight I wanted to dive into a topic uh, because many of you are are maybe embarking on a gluten-free diet for the first time. Maybe um, maybe this is your first diet. Maybe some of you are, are like veterans in this whole arena of the gluten-free diet and you've already got it down. And so for those of you, maybe this will be some repetitive nature or redundancy in terms of what you may already know, but probably not. We're probably going to shed some light on some darkness for you today and help you improve your health goals for the new year. So we're going to be talking today a lot about the research because one of the biggest questions I get asked when people are going on a gluten-free diet, very simply put, is corn gluten safe on a gluten-free diet? Is corn gluten safe on a gluten-free diet? And so we're going to be diving into why and what you should know about corn gluten and what you should understand about it because it's just such a topic for so many people that there's just so much confusion. And I want to show you the science because many of you don't actually understand there's so much science on corn gluten and how how it can pose a problem. And uh, and, and so we're going to dive a little bit into that tonight. The FDA has has some rules on what is and what is a gluten free diet. But FDA rules are not gluten are not rules about gluten as gluten is. So understand. Sorry, I'm typing and talking at the same time. So FDA gluten-free rules. Number one, FDA defines the gluten-free diet not as anything more than a, what, what we would refer to as a gliadin-free diet, meaning it's not a gluten-free diet. It's a gliadin-free diet. And so those of you who have never heard that terminology before, let me educate you. Gluten-free, very simply put, gluten-free, looks like my, there we go. Gluten-free is, in essence, it's, it's gluten is, by FDA standard, it is only referring to gliadin. Now, what is gliadin? Gliadin is the name of, of a protein uh, sequence found in wheat, barley, and rye. So this particular protein sequence was discovered back in 1952 at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And uh, it was discovered by a group of researchers who were discussing discussing and, and trying to identify the cause of celiac disease. And what they did is they identified this particular protein called gliadin. And it was, again, it was a particular sequence of protein that, that you know, gliadin itself was oftentimes referred to as gluten. So the two terms gliadin and gluten were used synonymously or interchangeably, even though they're, they're not synonyms. Gluten is defined, if we define what gluten actually is, Gluten is the name of the family of plant proteins, the family of proteins found within the seeds of grass. Seeds of grass are basically the seeds of grass. If we think about all the different grasses, there's wheat, barley, rye, oat, corn, rice, sorghum, millet, tash, triticale. There's a lot of different grasses. But the FDA uses the definition for gluten. They don't use all glutens. They just use alpha gliadin. And I'll spell this for you. Alpha gliadin is the FDA's definition. So alpha as in alpha male, but alpha gliadin is the name of what the FDA considers to be gluten. So if you're buying a gluten-free food at the grocery store, or if you're looking at a gluten-free label and it says certified gluten-free, it only really means alpha gliadin-free. It does not mean grain-free, which is why I wrote No Grain, No Pain, which is why I, I created the foundation, my foundation online, gluten-freesociety.org, because I wanted to get this information and disseminate it to more people who were struggling there's so many people that go on what we call a traditional gluten-free diet. I mean, they cut out wheat, barley, and rye, but they continue to eat corn and rice and oats and sorghum and some of the other grains. 
because those grains don't have alpha gliadin in them. And that's what they've been told. They've been told by their GI doctor. They've been told by their nutritionist. They've been told by whatever doctors is taking care of them that, hey, look, if you have celiac disease or if you have a problem with gluten, you only need to avoid wheat, barley, and rye. And what ends up happening is these people avoid wheat, barley, and rye, but then they buy all these cornbreads and rice breads and sorghum pastas and things of that nature, and they end up getting sick again. So um, I want you to understand that if we're truly talking about gluten, gluten is the, is the family of proteins found in all grain. It's not specific just to wheat, barley, and rye, but if we're talking about what the FDA calls gluten, we're only talking about alpha gliadin. So very, very important that we just start this conversation by delineating that because there are a number of different forms of gluten and all grain by definition has different types of gluten. As a matter of fact, I think the last uh, the, at last count, there were about a thousand different forms of gluten found in grain. And understand that wheat alone has hundreds of different types of gluten. And it's not even just alpha gliadin that's the only type of gluten. So, so keep those things in mind that just because something says gluten free by the FDA in the United States, if you're tuning in in Europe, or if you're tuning in from overseas, this, you know, I don't know what the laws in your country pertain to, but in the United States, alpha gliadin on a food label is, is what they're referring to to when you're reading a food label that reads gluten-free. Uh, looks like we got more and more people uh, chiming in from all over the place here. Isabel from Lisbon. Um, yeah, Sophie chiming in from France. Good to, good to see you're back, Sophie. Okay, um, so anyway, I want you to understand that alpha gliadin, again, is not the same thing as gluten. Alpha gliadin is a type of gluten found in wheat, barley, and rye, but there are lots of glutens that are found in wheat, barley, and rye that are not alpha gliadin. So, if we're talking about a food label, it only needs to be alpha gliadin free to be called gluten free. And that's where all the confusion starts to set in for many people. In essence, what I want you to walk away from this conversation understanding is that a gluten free aisle is a complete waste of your time if you're just looking on the front of the package and it's just saying gluten free. And that's aside from the fact that a lot of your gluten free food items that are labeled gluten free out there are garbage. They're full of sugar. They're full of genetically modified product. They're full of pesticide. They're full of additives like hydrogenated fats. They're full of dyes. They're just not, a lot of them are just not good for you. That doesn't mean that every product labeled gluten free is, is, is bad for you, but you just have to be a discerning consumer. You've got to look at that. Don't just buy it because the box says gluten free. Flip it over and look at the ingredients and make sure you understand the terms. Make sure you understand what's actually in what you're buying. So. If we talk about corn gluten again, though, I want to I want to make sure that that we get back into this because a lot of you are buying products that are labeled gluten free, but that do have corn gluten in them. Now, if we look at the research on corn gluten, there have been a number of research studies showing detriment of corn gluten. As a matter of fact, one of the earlier studies was published in the late or or rather the late 70s so as far back as 1978 where we're going back in time and we're saying okay look we've identified that the corn gluten itself for celiac patients for people with a known diagnosis of of celiac disease causes damage in a lot of different people with with celiac disease so some of these studies show that it was corn itself not cross contaminated corn but the actual corn so again delineation because a lot of people that are out there are spreading false information saying oh the corn is just cross contaminated with wheat and that's why the people react to it not not necessarily true not 100 percent true corn gluten itself can is actually been shown in a number of research studies to cause an inflammatory response to people with gluten sensitivity issues again studies going back as far as 1978 victoria just chiming in from ontario canada north of the border hi victoria welcome tonight uh let's see here I want to, this is something I, that's near and dear to my heart, this topic. Um, Elizabeth is, is chiming in. Let's just show this real quick. I thought I was celiac because of the, and this is, I'm going to assume this is a misspelling, but that should read glyphosate, not glyphosate. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, Elizabeth, if you mean something different. But I thought I was celiac because of glyphosate that Monsanto sprays on wheat. It's the product called Roundup. No. Although glyphosate can, has been shown to, to cause damage to the intestinal lining, um, and it's possible that a person who's got, an, who's got a diagnosis of celiac disease has it as a result of exposure to other than wheat, foods other than wheat. So, so for example, glyphosate can cause GI damage. But um, we've also found there are a number of, there's a research study published, uh, oh, it was about 20 years ago, that found that corn causes villus atrophy identical to the, 
the alpha gluten or the wheat found the, the, the gluten found in wheat and rye. A study also showed that that dairy can cause villus atrophy and that soy can cause villus atrophy. So those of you who are tuning in, maybe you've got a diagnosis of celiac disease. It depends on how you were diagnosed. If your doctor did a, what typically what they do, which is they run a scope, an upper GI, and they run down and they do a biopsy or a, a tissue sample selection from your small intestine, and what they look for is something called villus atrophy. If they diagnosed your celiac disease based on the presence or absence of villus atrophy, meaning that generally with celiac disease, if you have the presence of villus atrophy, you get the diagnosis of celiac disease, and you get automatically told, don't eat wheat, barley, and rye. It's very, very rare. As a matter of fact, I don't think in 16 years of clinical practice that I've ever seen a doctor other than myself and maybe a couple of select colleagues who actually, when, when the patient gets a, a biopsy done and has positive villus atrophy, where they've actually gone in and ruled out what caused the villus atrophy, because lots of things can cause flattening of the villi, and glyphosate is one of them, but so is gliadin or the wheat. Uh, what the protein, the gluten found in wheat and barley and rye, but so can other forms of gluten. The gluten in corn, the zein can actually create villus atrophy. Soy protein can create villus atrophy. Dairy protein can create villus atrophy. Parasite infection can create villus atrophy. So if you've just, you've just had a, a, an upper GI and you've been told, look, you have villus atrophy, therefore you have celiac disease, but nobody ruled out those other things, then you may have been misdiagnosed. You may not have a correct or accurate diagnosis in full. So that would be the next conversation you want to have with that, di that doctor who diagnosed you is, you know, do I have celiac disease truly or do I have a reaction that's causing villus atrophy? Because let's, let's think about this just from a common sense perspective. If one food protein, as in gliadin or, or gluten, can cause villus atrophy, doesn't it make sense that others could as well? And if we close the door on everything else and just have this tunnel vision about only wheat, barley, and rye, isn't that somewhat limiting in terms of, 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 of knowledge? Isn't that somewhat limiting in terms of intelligence? And that isn't it feasibly possible that other food proteins could also cause villus atrophy? Of course it is. So, so again, it's all a part of, of delineating. If you've got that celiac diagnosis and you don't know why, but you've just been told that it's wheat, barley, and rye, maybe you felt better avoiding wheat, barley, and rye. And, and maybe that's part of it, maybe, but maybe there are other pieces to this puzzle for you. And maybe those pieces of the puzzle happen to be corn or dairy or soy or a parasite infection or other food-based proteins that can also contribute to inflammatory damage of your small intestine. I just had a patient um, this past month who had been told she, she had villus atrophy on her biopsy. But the doctor, the, the GI doctor said, yeah, but this is villus atrophy. It's not like celiac villus atrophy. It's not like celiac disease. So therefore, you don't need to change your diet at all. So he actually had it, and he told her to not go gluten-free. I mean, I, I've seen some crazy things. That's got to be one of the craziest. But, but at any rate, we want to get back on this topic of corn gluten because many of you, again, are buying corn gluten products and, or corn products, and you're, you're assuming that they're safe because you've been told that they're safe. But again, study in 1978 showed that corn gluten caused damage to patients with celiac disease. Another study pushed in 2005 in the journal Gut found that, uh, that corn directly created an inflammatory reactivity in the intestines of people with gluten sensitivity. In essence, this study showed uh, it measured inflammation through looking at a chemical called nitride, which is an inflammatory mediator, an inflammatory byproduct. And in this case, corn was what caused it. There was another study, and this, uh, this, this study was published finding that not only did, did gluten cause villus atrophy, but the, the casein from, particularly from genetically modified cows, could cause it as well as could soy, especially in particular genetically modified soy. There was another group of studies, this one coming out of, uh, it was 1991, where, where it was a study actually done on celiac patients, and they, what they showed is that celiac patients were reacting to corn gluten independently of wheat, meaning even if you took the wheat away and you took the, the traditional gluten out of the diet, they were still reacting to the corn. And the authors of this study actually concluded saying, you know, this is, this is intriguing as that corn is, is assumed to be a safe substitute in those with, with celiac disease and gluten sensitivity. And so their warning was these people need to be better investigated and that this topic needs to be better investigated before um, before we can just assume that this corn is, is, is wholly safe, this corn gluten is wholly safe for all of those people out there with gluten sensitivity issues. 
And then there was another study. Actually, if you go, I'm going to put this link up because that's, you know, any of you are, you know, if you're nerds like me, you want to read the research and you want to look at, you know, the actual evidence and, you know, you know, make some kind of um, make some kind of uh, observations yourself. So this study was published in 2012. It's one of the more recent ones on corn gluten. And what they found is that corn gluten, and I just put it up there for you, corn gluten actually created a greater inflammatory response and interacted with what's called the HLA-DQ antenna or the HLA-DQ receptor on the surface of the immune cells of patients with gluten sensitivity. Corn reacted greater than wheat, meaning corn's reaction was worse than wheat's reaction. And this, again, this was a study where it was analyzing people with the gluten genetic markers. So those people that had genetic markers for gluten sensitivity were actually reacting to corn gluten worse than wheat gluten. And so, again, this is a, this is a study, a major study, published major, major medical journal that found this information. But how many of you, if you, how many of those of you who hadn't read No Grain, No Pain or who hadn't been exposed to my research and work, how many of you would have just kept eating corn or would have assume that because because the reality is is that the vast majority of people with celiac disease are completely ignorant about the, the elements that uh, the elements of danger that corn actually and corn quote unquote gluten free corn based products can actually pose to to their health and that's just the gluten aspect of it so those studies that I, I was just mentioning those are all studies about corn gluten and corn gluten specifically, so not not glyphosate. Now that's a whole nother matter in and of itself, as as we were talking about a minute ago. Many of you um, suspect glyphosate as being one of the major culprits to the corn, and of course it can be, but but corn gluten can be as well. So don't be quick to blame glyphosate for everything. Many people are now moving on that bandwagon of just blaming glyphosate and saying, oh, gluten was never bad for you. It's ne it's really just the glyphosate that's being sprayed on the wheat and being sprayed on the corn. And although that's true, that's true that the glyphosate that's being sprayed is not healthy for humans. It's, it's a it's a p potential poison. It causes leaky gut. It can create a whole lot of a whole lot of different problems. I actually interviewed one of the lead authors for the one of the major papers that was published a couple of years ago on glyphosate and, and the damage it can cause. Her name is Stephanie Sinniff. Uh, let's see if I can if I can post that interview for you if you want to hear it from the horse's mouth. In essence, we had a nice long conversation about the fact that it isn't just glyphosate and about how it's it's glyphosate plus uh, it, it's also gluten plus it's also other things that are within the grain that can create the problem. So I want you to be clear to not just jump on that bandwagon of people that are dismissing um, gluten sensitivity as a whole and blaming simply blaming glyphosate. Although again, glyphosate does play a role. It um, it's just a part of this puzzle. It's not the solution to this puzzle. And there's that. I just published in the feed, I just posted the link to that interview that uh, that I did with Dr. Sniff at MIT on glyphosate creating damage so that you can have access to that information as well. So again, it's part of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. I'm going to talk a little bit too. I wanted to, to tap in and, and show you a couple of other studies on corn gluten. And I want to also publish a link for you where you can actually find a number of these studies uh, and, and again, read them for yourself. So I'm gonna put that in the feed next. So corn gluten studies, it's gonna show up as corn gluten studies for you. So if you wanna follow that link, go back to gluten free study, follow that link, you'll, you'll have access to all those different studies that have been done on corn gluten over the last many years, again, as early as 1978, so that you can have a better understanding of the problem, but corn has been studied in, in response to the antibodies that corn gluten causes people with gluten sensitivity to produce. It's been studied as causing inflammation directly to the gut through another mechanism. It's been it's been studied as far as corn oil causing villus atrophy in people. It's been shown that corn, from a non-gluten perspective, that the mold in corn, in essence, that corn is highly contaminated with mold and mycotoxins like aflatoxin, and that it's actually, for some people, it's aflatoxin and the mold toxin in the corn that actually contributes to damage and the inflammation to the GI tract. And then it's been studied that corn gluten acts just like wheat gluten and in inner exchanges with that same HLA-DQ antenna on the surface of immune cells that recognize gluten as a threat and actually causes a greater reaction or a greater response than wheat gluten causes. So again, all of those are studies that have been done. This is not information that I 
just decided to, to create. This is research that's actually been done. It's actually been published. And, uh, and unfortunately, so many people ignore it. And, and unfortunately, so many doctors ignore it. And that really is, is a big part of the crux of the problem is that you go to the hospital. If you've got a diagnosis through a major university or through your, your gastroenterologist, this conversation's probably never been had because of your gastroenterologist, and I'm not saying all of them, but many of them, many of your GI doctors don't have this training because they haven't read their own literature. I mean, these are studies published in major, major medical journals in gastroenterology and gastrointestinal medical journals. And, and there's a very, very real danger and a very, very real threat to those of you who've been diagnosed with celiac disease and don't have this information because if you keep going on that path of consuming corn gluten, you can end up in a much, much, much worse place and not even know it and not even know why you're getting sick. Because understand this, many of you got a diagnosis originally of celiac disease, which means your symptoms may have been diarrhea, they may have been chronic intestinal pain. You may have suffered with some of the neurological symptoms associated with celiac disease, but that's where a lot of people get their first diagnosis. And then when they go gluten-free, traditionally, they take out wheat, barley, and rye, they do feel better, but then they gravitate more toward corn products, and then they start developing other problems that are autoimmune in nature. Maybe it doesn't flare up their celiac disease, but maybe it contributes to Hashimoto's, like a th an autoimmune thyroid problem, or maybe it contributes to autoimmune hepatitis, autoimmune liver problems. So realize that it doesn't necessarily have to create the same exact type of response that wheat gluten causes in an individual, but it can still create an inflammatory response. And if you're not tuned in to recognizing what that may be, you can end up eating corn and thinking that your liver disease or your thyroid disease or your skin disease or your other intestinal disease that's not celiac disease has nothing to do with diet. And then it's just something entirely altogether. That's where a lot of the people that come to see me for my expertise that's what they've been told, and that's why they actually end up in my office because they've gotten sicker and sicker and sicker and can't figure out what it is that, that, that um, that's creating their illness. And, and they've been told to dismiss food entirely because if it's not celiac disease, most doctors say it doesn't have anything to do with food or diet at all. So, again, very, very important that, that you understand that. Let's see here. We've got Cindy chiming in from Orlando and uh, another Missouri uh, another Missouri citizen, Anita from Independence, Missouri. Yeah, we just we just drove through Independence. Um, let's see here. Victoria, hi Victoria. Bought the book, No Grain, No Pain, Love It. Oh, oh well, that's great, Victoria. Let us share your story and let us know how you're doing with those with phase uh, chapter uh, well phase one and phase two, chapter seven and chapter eight uh, of the book, and let us know how you're doing on those diets uh, on those diet phases. Diana from Dallas, Texas is chiming in. Looks, looks like Mandy got, that's the kind of diagnosis that she got, what we were talking about earlier. Uh, Jessica's asking if we can spell villus atrophy. Yeah, it's V-I-L-L-O-U-S atrophy, A-T-R-O-P-H-Y. Okay, let's see here. So Michelle chiming in, if you have highly elevated IgA or IgG antibodies, that's celiac disease. No, if you have highly IgG, high LL levels of IgG or IgA, that's a reaction. That's not necessarily a celiac reaction. Now, if, the, if they're testing the antibodies specifically to gliadin, so high levels of elevated antibodies to alpha gliadin, then, then that's, a, that's a marker that you might have celiac disease. But... Um, but just having IgA and IgG antibodies that are high, it, it depends on what their antibodies to. And so that would be the thing you'd get differentiation in your antibody testing. Let's see here. I don't know where to start. There's so many questions pouring in here. So let's start from the beginning. Well, this is this isn't a question, but it's it's something everybody should hear. Tracy times in. I had several negative biopsies that uh, since going on the free diet, my villi healed. Just giving up wheat, barley, and rye. Yeah, your villi healed giving up wheat, barley, and rye. But if if you continue to eat corn and rice and other grains, the question then becomes: Is there inflammatory damage in other areas of your body? Because remember that most people with celiac disease on average will develop seven more forms of autoimmunity over a lifetime. 
and that and that um, oftentimes the reason those autoimmune diseases and conditions continue to persist and go on is because they're continuing to eat those other forms of gluten-based grain proteins in their diet. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Here's a good one. Leona's chiming in. I can answer that one. I, I got an omelet that was supposed to be safe, took a bite, and a kernel of corn fell out. I apparently ate a piece or two and ended up with stomach cramps for two days. Corn is GMO. Bad. Yeah, I can agree with you more, Leona. Let's see. Leslie, hi from London. My daughter was diagnosed with celiac disease in 78. I'm gluten brine, oat, corn, and soy free since having a thyroidectomy in 2015 and feel so much better off those foods. Gluten-free products in the UK are full of rubbish. Couldn't agree with you more, Leslie, and thank you for sharing that experience um, all the way from England with us. Let's see, Kathy's at, that makes sense, but what do we do? What do we eat? Is, is, it is in everything. If no wheat, it has corn. Kathy, don't, don't fret. Um, the first thing that you do is you go through the process of educating and getting through this learning curve of what to do. I mean, most people where they, where they really end up struggling, it's, it's because they don't take the time to properly go through their diet and to properly basically reeducate themselves about how they need to prepare foods. Uh, and they get lost in the paralysis of, of, oh my gosh, everything has it. There's nothing, then they feel hopeless. So the first step is don't feel hopeless. Second step is don't eat any more of it on purpose, like no purposeful gluten exposure, so no purposeful grain exposure. So what do you do? There are a number of different things that you can do, and if you don't have a copy of No Grain, No Pain, that's one of them. The 31 recipes in that book that are easy to make, that are family favorites, that, um, that where you can start. That's a really, really great place to start, and it's sanctioned and, and sanctioned by, you know, by, you know, my discerning, uh, by my discerning hand, so we know it's going to be grain free, but we also know it's going to give you a good starting point as to what to do. Beyond that, it's it's you've got to really, really be committed to to changing your diet. Because if you're not willing to change your diet, there's not a whole lot that's going to change about your health. If if you're struggling by eating some of those other gluten free quote unquote again gluten free products that aren't really technically gluten free. Let's see here. Looks like, Elizabeth, I'm going to stop corn products. Give it a test and see what happens. We'll let you know. Yeah, let us know, Elizabeth, for sure. Chime in and, and, and come back on the uh, Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show and chime in and let us know what your experience was. Um, so, Jessica, clarity question. Are you saying that eating any corn is bad as well, or is corn gluten an additive? No, corn, corn, all corn has gluten in it. Meaning that the name of the gluten in corn is called zane. It's a protein. It's a storage protein found in the kernel. And and so if you're eating corn, you're getting corn gluten. That's what that means. So it's not corn gluten is this additive that isn't corn. It's that corn gluten zane is a protein found in corn. So if you're eating corn, you're getting exposure to that protein. Good question. Uh, Beverly Beverly chiming in. Corn makes me stick as a dog. Uh, Paula. Uh, I have to avoid any grain at all. Yeah, Laurie's chiming in. Endos, I, I mean, I'm going to assume you mean your, your endoscopy. Didn't say anything with corn. It was your book that changed my diet. Oh, oh fantastic. I'm, I'm hoping it changed your life for the better as well. Let's see here. I have been diagnosed for over 10 years and do not have any trouble with corn. Would never continue to eat gluten. Too many other problems arise. I would challenge that. I would challenge that. Um, that with corn, um, again, you know, without having a conversation about your health in, in particular, or on, and, you know, on Facebook Live, um, you know, if you're if you're having any other types of autoimmune struggles or any other type of mysterious illness that you're being medicated for, you really should challenge that stance on corn. That's just you know my two cents for it. Uh, Candice, I got off corn and gluten and healed. Tracy chiming in. I'm glad I know about corn now. It makes sense why I'm still having problems. Yeah, it's very, very common for that to be the case. Let's see here. Isabel, uh, all tests negative for celiac disease, but my son 30 can't eat gluten since 2014 and feels better. So no gluten, no lactose, no sugar, and so on. Well, 
that's a lot of people's experience. And the reason why, again, I go back to the testing for celiac disease. The testing for celiac disease is not specific. It's actually extremely inaccurate um, because you're relying on a villus atrophy presence for the diagnosis to even occur. And understand that, that the villi, by the time the villi have flattened, you've got decades of damage as a result of gluten if that's the way your body reacts to gluten. Some people's bodies don't react to gluten by having villus atrophy. Some people's bodies react to gluten in, in different mannerisms. So many people have gluten-induced neuropathy. So gluten is a neurotoxin and it can damage the nerves. Um, for some people, gluten damages the brain. It's, there's links to gluten and schizophrenia directly. They, as a matter of fact, the earliest known name for schizophrenia was bread madness. Um, there are linkages to gluten-inducing autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, there are linkages to gluten causing Hashimoto's thyroiditis or, or hypothyroidism. There are links to gluten causing vitiligo and dermatitis or pediformis, which is a skin disease, uh, as well as eczema and psoriasis. There are links to gluten creating or contributing to rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma and dermatomyositis and, and uh, ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis. So Again, you may not have a gut issue, and so when you go in and you get this test to see whether you're gluten sensitive and, you're, and the test you're relying on is a celiac test, you can have gluten sensitivity but not have celiac damage. It's, it's very, very common. As a matter of fact, it's much more common to have gluten sensitivity, not celiac disease. So if your, do if your doctor ran a test that ruled out celiac disease but didn't look at gluten sensitivity genetically, then they ran the wrong test and they get potentially, potentially now gave you a very, very misleading answer. Um, let's see here. You're welcome, Karen. Thanks for saying thank you. Um, let's see here. Shannon, can your stomach be healed based on biopsy, still gluten-free now, having Parkinson's-like symptoms and memory loss and non-multiple sclerotic lesions be caused by the corn? No one where I work uh, at the Alice Hyde Medical Center in New York knows very little about the link. So just learning from you. So Shannon, to answer your question, yes, I've actually seen cases of Parkinson's go into remission um, when we got them on what, what, what I call true gluten-free diet, which is no grain. You have to get the corn out as well. MS lesions, yes. Can it be caused by corn? Yes. I've seen cases where MS lesions could be or were being contributed to as a result of corn-induced damage. So to answer your question, yes, clinically, um, there's definitely a correlation. And, uh, and, and so it you know, look, it's a simple diet change as opposed to having MS-like disease and Parkinson's for, and, and having that progression with memory loss. Um, going going corn-free and grain-free is a very, very small price to pay. I know a lot of people, they get paralyzed with that thought. And they, in their own head, they, they, end up, they end up stopping themselves going forward and getting better because they feel like the pain of the diet change is greater than the pain of having that illness and having to deal and manage that illness for the rest of their life and manage the medicine for the rest of their life. I frankly find that to be a little bit concerning because look, the reality is this diet change is infinitely easier than managing autoimmune disease. Um, and it doesn't matter what auto form of autoimmune disease that you have. So, I mean, Shannon, the first thing I'd have you do is get go get you a copy of No Grain, No Pain and follow chapter seven and eight. And, you know, chime in on another, on another Monday night when we do these shows every Monday night at six, six Central Standard Time. Chime in and let us know how you're doing and how you're feeling. Because um, the reality is it's very possible that that's part of the link that you're experiencing. And as to my point a minute ago, Terry's chiming in, OMG, kill me. Now nothing left to eat. No, Terry, there's plenty left to eat. Hope is always there. Look, there are 300 plus varieties of fruits and vegetables and meats that you probably eat maybe 10% of. It's not that there's nothing left to eat. It's that your experience with what is to eat is very, very limited. And this is the learning curve. If you if you expand your experience and your knowledge base and start committing to that experience and knowledge base, it gets super easy and that you don't feel quite so overwhelmed. So again, I, I just I want to encourage you, if you're especially those of you who are listening to this and you're still struggling, you're already on that wheat barley rye, you know, traditional gluten-free diet, you're still struggling and you're being diagnosed with more conditions and you're being medicated and you've got autoimmune disease and you haven't found a solution. Look, if you're one of those people, you really got to consider the no grain to pain aspect because if you're not, look, what's the alternative? The alternative, again, it's managing a disease of potentially very dangerous chronic diseases. The average person with autoimmune disease has 10 years less life. And to me, that's a simple trade. Diet for 10 years, I mean, what can you do in a decade, especially in a decade where your quality of life has improved? 
Let's see, Annie's chiming in. So amazing you are addressing this. My daughter gets so sick eating anything with gluten or corn, and we're surprised to see that health food stores sell so many gluten-free products filled with corn as a substitute. We keep waiting for the day that this changes and they take corn out of the gluten-free products. Nobody else is talking about it. Look, everybody else is scared to talk about it. Look, I've been threatened with lawsuits. Um, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but I, I – um, there was a major, major university that, that, that approached me and they wanted me to retract all of my statements on corn gluten. And when I actually offered to do a live debate in front of Facebook Live with the rest of the world, they declined the live debate. Um, the other thing that happened uh, was I found out I found out months later that they were receiving they were receiving grant money and funding from some of these corn producers. So meaning that they, they didn't want to have the corn conversation, even though, again, when I talk about corn gluten, it's not my research. I didn't do the actual study. I didn't actually sit down and perform the study. These were studies that were performed by other PhDs and MDs and doctors in other areas of the world, and, and they were validated, and they went through the peer review process and were published in journals, and that these studies identified corn gluten as a problem, not, not my own clinical. Now, my own clinical research identifies corn gluten as a problem, uh, all the time in, in patients, but but the studies have been done. It's just that a lot of these universities that are diagnosing celiac disease, they don't want to have this conversation. They don't even want to entertain it. They don't even want to bring it up. They don't even want to look at it. They don't want to publicly discuss it in a forum because they get money and funding from companies that produce a lot of these crappy gluten-free products that are poisoning so many people with celiac disease. And the bottom line is, is the reality is, and this really fires me up, is that when you've got companies that are out there that are pawning their garbage junk food to people who are chronically sick as a mechanism to get healthy, that's unethical and immoral. I don't care who you are. You, you can't get healthy eating food that isn't healthy, even if it is gluten-free. If it's full of garbage and sugar and GMO and pesticide, you're not going to restore somebody's damaged gut eating garbage. So these people, shame on them for having poor ethical and moral background where they're going to pawn that stuff off and they're going to they're going to basically give away their product and support funding and research that supports the use of their products and silence people like myself who are actually trying to get out there and voice reality so that people can find an answer and get healthy. Those people are deplorable in my in my opinion. Uh, anyway, I'm going to get off that horse for a minute. Let's get back to questions. Yeah, so here's a good point. Gretchen's just chiming in here. Gluten-free for eight years and corn-free for six. Avoiding gluten is a breeze compared to corn. So, so if, if Gretchen can do it, I think those are the other ones of you that are listening can do it as well. Anna is chiming in about quinoa. Quinoa, I'm being told, is a seed and not a grain and that it does not contain gluten. How true is this or not true at all? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to post a study on quinoa. Because quinoa technically is not a is not a um, grain. It's a seed, but it's not a grain, and um, it technically doesn't have gluten. However, that being said, I'm going to post this up here for you. This research on quinoa. There was a study published a few years ago that showed that the proteins in quinoa looked so much like gluten proteins that that it was causing an inflammatory reaction in people. So, you know, you, it's one of those areas where quinoa as a seed, although technically not a seed of grass, it's a seed, it's a seed of fruit. It can, it, it has basically gluten mimicking proteins that for many people it creates a problem for and creates inflammation for. That's why, and that's why I, I recommend getting the quinoa out of your diet, especially if you're still struggling. It, it, because it looks like gluten, the proteins, some of the proteins in the quinoa can look like gluten. Okay, good question, Anna. All right. Let's see here. Is Elizabeth asking me what book? It's called No Grain, No Pain, published by Simon & Schuster Touchstone, available at, at uh, national bookstores everywhere and also available on Amazon if you want to go look more and read more into it. Well, we got another person from uh, tonight's Missouri's night, Melissa from Liberty, Missouri. Hi, Melissa. Thanks for chiming in. Um, let's see here. Can a virus cause low IgG and adrenal fatigue? It can, but in my experience with chronic illness, it generally is not viruses that that fuel a lot of the chronic illness. The, we all have exposure to viruses, um, like Epstein-Barr virus, for example. 
uh, is, is a classic one. Um, herpes virus is another example. We all have exposure to these viruses. And for most people, a lot of people, if we were to measure viral titers in their blood, we would find that we would find positive for viral titers. That doesn't mean that they have viral disease. So it, um, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily, just because you've been tested for a virus doesn't mean that that's what's creating your problem. And I, I run into a lot of people who have, they have viral titers that are high, but they're not sick because of the virus. They're actually sick because they keep eating corn and rice and other forms of grain that have glutens in them that they just haven't been told about. And once they cut the grain out, their, their virus becomes a non-issue or what they thought was a virus becomes a non-issue. Their symptoms go away. So you might, you might look into that. Oh, here we go. From Malaysia, all the way from Malaysia. So hi from Malaysia. I stopped corn and my joint pain subsided. I have third stage osteoarthritis. It didn't so much when I stopped wheat and oat, but wheat, barley, rye, oat, and corn, I improved tremendously. Another, you know, again, another person, you know, from Malaysia, I, I get this kind of thing all the time in my clinic. Um, you know, people, you know, going wheat, barley, and rye free don't, don't experience the benefit, don't experience the change. And, and it really, really takes a full no grain diet to really get them to, to experience the benefit and the change. Um, can I ever eat rice and potatoes again? Depends. So, you know, this is one of those, it's a personalized type of question. You know, with, with gluten, if you've been properly tested for gluten sensitivity, then you've had HLA, DQ, alpha 1, and beta 1 genetic testing done. If you don't know what that is, you can go read more about it on gluten, on gluten free society. I'll put up a, I'll see if, if Alan's tuning in, I can have him put up that link for us, the genetic testing link where you can learn more about genetic testing on gluten. Um, cause that's the only real accurate way to ascertain whether or not a person needs to be gluten free as far as, and so that would answer your question about rice, but with potatoes, look, that's a, that's a different entity altogether. A lot of people with something called HLA B27 positivity shouldn't eat potatoes because those people are genetically susceptible to the compounds in potatoes and, and those compounds creating joint pain and joint problems. So, uh, you know, have you been tested? Tawanda would really be the question. Has your doctor done the diligent type of testing that will help you get that answer? Let's see, Victoria, I am currently working through Candida Cleanse. I will be in the No Grain, No Pain 30-day challenge after that. I'm trying to rid myself of extreme sinus, head congestion, brain fog, neuro issues, 10 years of agony, feeling better already without the grain slash dairy. A virtual high five, Victoria. I'm glad you're feeling better already, and thanks for sharing that. And let us know how your 30-day challenge works out. So Melody, are there corn-based natural pesticides sprayed into organic fruits and vegetables? No, um, not sprayed, but sometimes corn gluten is used as a, as a fertile, or not a fertilizer, but as a pesticide on the ground. So it's applied to the soil and the ground to, to repel bugs, uh, but not directly sprayed on. Now, now there are corn glazes and there are waxes and things of that nature that can be put on, but not, not necessarily for pesticide purposes. Uh, Raquel is asking about organic corn. No, organic corn is not gluten-free. It still contains zane. It just doesn't contain glyphosate. And so Raquel, go back in the feed. I posted a link a moment about glyphosate, uh, a link, an interview with Dr. Sinef at MIT, and we talked about glyphosate and corn. But, but organic corn still has the corn gluten zane in it, which can still be problematic. Again, this is what I was talking about earlier. Don't be quick to blame glyphosate for everything, which is what a lot of people are doing right now. They're just jumping on the glyphosate blame bandwagon and they're wrong. Now, they may be partially right, but they're wrong. You've got to look at it from the entire perspective. And you've also got to look at it from the individual perspective, from the person. Not We can't make a blanket statement. Um, let's see here. So Anjali is struggling from Utah, struggling with gastroparesis and, and with which foods I have to eat and not to eat. Because it's a tough one with gastroparesis because everything hurts, right? You eat and your food's not moving through you and it's, you know, you're backed up and, you're, and your bowels are not digesting very well. And so in those types of cases, some of the great things that you can at least attempt to do is you can use a support, digestive support enzyme. Make sure you're getting plenty of magnesium because it can help with the motility of your GI tract. 
But in my experience with gastroparesis, and again, I would go back and ask your doctor to test you and make sure you rule out mold exposure because mold, a hidden mold, either in the home or a hidden yeast infection in your GI tract, oftentimes those can be the, the perpetual trigger for gastroparesis and lead you and leave you in a state of poor digestion. So it doesn't matter what you eat, everything you eat bothers you because you're not capable of digesting very effectively. So um, that would be something I would say, in Angelita, to, to go back and talk with your local doctor about and see if they can't help test you. Let's see here. I like this. I like this comment. Eat real food, fresh vegetables, fruits, grass fed beef, eggs from chickens fed organic. You just have to make the habits a little at a time. I mean, that's great advice. Thank you for chiming in on that, Elizabeth, because I think a lot of people are going to find that advice very helpful. Debbie's asking about popcorn. No, popcorn has gluten in it, has zane in it. So, again, it's it's it's, it's a form of corn gluten. It's it's still bad. And popcorn is one of the worst things you can eat anyway. I mean, it, especially if you're buying it at the movies where it's doused in, in vegetable oil and hydrogenated fats. Um, another melody, are we talking just actual corn like chips and tortillas or all of the hidden corn based in most of the foods at the grocery store? No, we're talking about all the hidden corn. And as a matter of fact, on that very topic, um, because that's, you know, again, that's, that's another one. I'm going to post a link to hidden based corn ingredients for you so that you'll have a long list. So many of you in this list that I post up, I'm getting ready to post it now, but many of you are reacting to um, you're reacting to your supplements or you're reacting to your cosmetics or you're reacting to certain things and you can't quite figure it out. Um, check out this list because you're going to find like especially supplements a lot of them contain corn fillers and you're just not even aware of it and a lot of products supplements that are claiming to be gluten free contain corn based fillers and that's why a lot of people continue to struggle they're taking a supplement with corn filler in it and uh and they're still struggling because they're still getting exposure to to different types of corn gluten through those fillers uh, another question, are these intolerances happening even if we eat heirloom? Yeah, they can. Look, if you're allergic to something or intolerant to something, you're allergic to or intolerant to it, regardless of the fact of whether it's organic or not. That doesn't really play a role in it. Now, can you also be reactive to the pesticide and can the pesticide create a problem as well? Absolutely. But it's, you know, it's, um, it's, it's if you're reactive and intolerant to a food, you're reactive or intolerant to it, whether it's heirloom or whether it's organic or whether it's conventional. So, so keep that in mind. The proteins are, are, are similar. Let's see here. Next question. Laura, for the genetic testing, do I need to be eating gluten? No, it's genetic and your genes don't change. And this is where you, this is what I was saying before. You can discern whether or not gluten free needs to be a part of your life forever if you know what your genetics are. If you don't know what your genetics are, a lot of doctors will test you for a gluten allergy. and They're not really truly testing an allergy test. They're testing what's called the delayed hour sensitivity test. And that's not a true allergy. It's not a forever. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a forever kind of thing. If you really want to know whether avoiding grain and gluten is the right thing to do for the rest of your life, you got to get genetic tested. In order to do that, you don't need to be eating gluten because it's genetic and your genes are what your genes are. They're what you inherit from mom and dad. Good question. Karen, is it corn, gluten, or GMO? I don't know if you just tuned in, Karen, but it's both. It's corn, gluten, and it's GMO. It's all the above, and it depends on the person as to which one it is or if it's both. It's one, it's the other, or it's both. But if you're gluten sensitive and you're eating corn, I can guarantee you um, there are very few guarantees in life, but if you're gluten-free and you're eating corn, if you've been diagnosed with celiac disease and you've been eating corn, you will get more diagnoses in your life of autoimmune disease. The average person gets another six diagnoses of autoimmune disease if they continue to persistently eat grain and so that's that's something that's been studied and that's something that we know so again um you know don't be so quick to blame just the gmo now i'm not saying go out and eat gmo i'm just simply saying that uh don't pawn off the gmo as this and and, or, and don't create organic corn or organic wheat or organic other grains as the solution because you'll be sourly and sorely disappointed in the way that you feel if you persistently eat those other grains and uh, and and 
just because they're organic if you're gluten sensitive. Again, if you're gluten sensitive, the caveat is if you are gluten sensitive. And again, the way you would understand whether or not you're gluten sensitive or not is if you've had genetic testing done. Because look, you may have gone on a gluten-free diet and felt better, but you may have felt better not because of the gluten. You may have felt better because you weren't eating high levels of carbohydrates that are present in grain. You may have felt better because you weren't getting the mold exposure or the mycotoxin exposure that are common in grains. You may feel better because you've inverted your ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids. There are a lot of reasons why avoiding grain might make you feel better. Gluten is just one of them. Again, if you if that was all Greek to you and you've never heard that before, you need to read No Grain, No Pain because that that's part of what we explain. That's part of what I, I map out in the book is I, I want you to understand it's not just gluten. Sandy, hi. Nice to, nice to see you, Sandy. Those of you who don't know Sandy, she's... You know, she's a she's a, a perfect example of somebody who's done the no grain, no pain program and just had phenomenal results. You should you should check out her story. Let's see here. Uh, Doreen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to chime in here, not because I'm trying to insult your the advice, the kind of advice that you're giving, but to do an array 10 to look at corn isn't the right solution. The right solution to identify whether corn is a problem is genetic testing for gluten sensitivity. If you if you test, understand it, if you're testing for the array for the corn, you're simply testing for one kind of corn protein. You're not testing for the array of different glutens. If you test genetically, you'll have an answer for them all. So again, I, I just don't want somebody to be listening to the Dr. Osborne, pick Dr. Osborne brain show and be, be steered in a different direction or a wrong direction. Um, let's see here. If one is HLA B27 positive, does that mean that there is a, um, they should not have any grain? No, HLA B27 is a genetic marker that's linked to psoriatic arthritis and it's linked to psoriasis and Reiter syndrome. Um, this particular genetic marker, generally what that means from a diet perspective is if you are HLA B27 positive, you really want to make sure you're avoiding nightshades. That's a different class. It's not grains. Nightshades and grains are not the same thing. Nightshades are your potatoes, your tomatoes, your potatoes, your tomatoes, your peppers. And tobacco is a nightshade. Goji berries are a nightshade. Eggplant is a nightshade. So HLA B27 positive. And that list of foods is also in the book, No Grain, No Pain. You can, you can pull that up. Let's see, Karen's chiming in. I seem to react quickly to mold leaves at restaurants of salad, even pieces of lettuce, spinach with a touch of mold. Is this common? It, yes, I mean, you, there, there's a genetic marker called HLA-DR markers. So again, a lot of HLA markers, uh, but HLA-DR markers um, can tell you whether or not you have mold susceptibility. So you might have, Karen, you might have positive HLA-DR markers that, uh, that predispose you to, to a greater degree of sensitivity toward exposure to mold. You also might have mold somewhere else in your life, like mold in your home, somewhere hidden in your home or in your work or even in your car where you're getting chronic low grade or low dose exposure to mold and mycotoxins. And it's making you more and more and more sensitive over time. Those are the common scenarios that we might see um, as far as mold is concerned. Uh, Nancy's asking, is it positive? Is it possible to follow the no grain, no pain diet if you're vegan? Absolutely. Because. Look, most vegans, Nancy, and this may not describe you, so so I'm not trying to say this to describe you, but most vegans, they're they're grainitarians, right? I mean, really, truly, they're not. They don't eat a lot of vegetables and fruits. They predominantly eat a lot of processed grain-based products and soy processed soy products, and that's most. Again, I'm generalizing, um, but yeah, I mean, all the vegetables and fruits. There's a wide variety of of those. There's hundreds of different species. There's the squashes and there's, there's root vegetables. There's all different kinds of things that you can follow you need on the no grain, no pain plan that match your vegan diet. Uh, Aaron's asking, could I repeat the information about where to find information on gene testing? Let's, let's see here. Um, yes, so if you go to glutenfreesociety.org and there's a link at the top, it, reads, it says genetic testing and you just click on that link. I'm gonna post that in the feed for you. So you'll also have that as well. There you go. That's been posted in the feed, so you can follow the link. All right. Let's see. Goodbye, popcorn. That's right, Victoria. <laughs> Cry out. 
but you'll be better for it. Um, let's see. So good question, Michelle. How do they label it gluten-free if corn has gluten and how is it certified gluten-free? Because the FDA's definition is, as I said earlier, if you, when you get go back and listen to the replay of this, Michelle, um, earlier on in this conversation, we were talking about the definition of gluten. The FDA defines gluten as alpha gliadin. Alpha gliadin is only the type of gluten found in wheat, barley, and rye. And so that's how they get away with it. It's the FDA. It's the regulation as to how the FDA views the labeling of gluten-free products. If something has 20 parts per million or less of alpha gliadin, it can be legally labeled gluten-free in the United States of America. So that's how they get away with it. It's not that they're getting away with it. It's just you have to understand what definitions and the rules they're, they're playing the game by. They're using the rule of alpha gliadin as their definition for gluten. We're using the rule of the storage proteins found in all grains are glutens. So the family of proteins, their storage proteins found in grain that are soluble in alcohol are all glutens. And there are about a thousand different forms of gluten. As a matter of fact, a study published in 2010 identified 400 new forms of gluten. And 10% um, of these new identifiable glutens were more toxic than alpha gliadin. Again, alpha gliadin is the one the FDA bases the definition of gluten off of. What about those 40 new ones that were more toxic? That's my point, is that the science is still coming in on this, but you guys are not being told by your doctors. You're not being told the FDA is not keeping up on the science and they're not adjusting the definitions and the rules. I mean, if you really want to get these things changed, the best thing you can all do is write your senator, write your congressman and ask them and write your doctors and write the university hospitals and ask them, demand of them to take on this corn issue, demand of them to, to publish more research on this, to ask more questions about this and to actually be willing to come out in public and disclose who's paying them money behind the scenes to make them be quiet. Because that really, I mean, if you follow the money trail, and I mean, this has been my experience with it, if you follow that money trail, you'll have your answer. Um, let's see, Karen, I recently learned that the probiotic VSL number three now has cornstarch in it. What would be your second best probiotic recommendation? Uh, ultrabiotic defense, very easy, ultrabiotic defense. Um, it's a premium, high-grade, high-dose probiotic that's completely grain-free, and you can pick that up on Gluten-Free Society, uh, glutenfreesociety.org. If you if you just do a search, Ultrabiotic Defense, you'll pull that up. It's very, very uh, easy to find there. Let's see here. Good, good question. Yeah, they, it's actually, they didn't just add that. That's been in there for a really long time. VSL has had corn in it for a really long time. Yeah, so Beth is chiming in or asking, can it create pancreatic attacks because celiac and family had bowel issues but not pancreas since cold, which um, which kidneys hurt like heck if coughed or sneezed, I'm dehydrated too. So I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question in that, Beth, but I, I'm going to read between the lines and, and assume that your question is, can gluten exposure create pancreatitis? Yes. And I've seen that directly. I have seen that absolutely. I've, put, I've seen that put people in the hospital and put them near their deathbeds. So to answer your question, yes, it can. Okay, gosh, we just get so many questions coming in. I just don't have time to answer them all. We'll try to get to a, a few more. Um, a simple question. Is the probiotic you recommend okay for children uh, age six? Yes, it is. Um, and, and on that particular one, ultrabiotic defense, you'd give them half the dose. So it, it, it wouldn't be the full packet. They're in packets. You'd give them a half a packet at that at that age. Oh, here's a here's a good one. So to the question about pancreatitis, this is just Tracy chiming in. Her lipase went over 3,000. So that's just an example of of a gluten induced, you know, in, acute flare up of, of inflammation in the pancreas when lipase and, and amylase is another enzyme that gets measured um, when they start going up. You know, those are those are markers of pancreatitis. 
So Jan, how common is it to find all negatives in the gene testing? Um, it's, it's, so it depends. Like if we were to take the audience listening to this presentation, um, we probably wouldn't find it was very common at all because you wouldn't be listening if you didn't suspect, if you didn't have autoimmune disease or didn't suspect gluten sensitivity as an issue. If we were to take it in the general population across the board, it's estimated that 40%, which is quite high, 40% have gluten, some, some degree gluten sensitive intolerant gene patterns. So that, that's the best answer we can give you without actually testing everyone in the world. Um, Leslie, seminar in London, please. Do you ever come over here? Yeah, I do. I travel uh, abroad on occasion. Um, look, if you can, if you want to set something up on your end, if it's, if you know, I, I usually don't travel just specifically to go and do big events unless it's a big event. So if you've got, you know, three to five hundred plus people lined up, I'd be happy to make a special trip and 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 come and 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 share information and knowledge. Um, Denise is asking, do I have or do I do live courses? If so, do you ever come to Washington, D.C. area? I do um, I do live Facebook every Monday. Um, but as far as like uh, academic courses, yeah, I actually have a 10 hour postgraduate training course, although we've we've made it not live. I just don't have time to travel and do the, you know, the live education I used to. Um, but uh, but again, I, I'll extend the same invitation to you that I did to, to Leslie in, in London, which is, you know, if you if you want to spearhead an event, you know, within your hometown, I, I will make an exception and come if you if you bring the audience, because I don't I don't want to, you know, you know, I don't want to leave my family and, 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 and make a special endeavor and trip to come and, and, and talk to a room where crickets are chirping. I, it really has to be worth my while because my clinic keeps me very, very busy, as does as does my writing and as does my research uh, and as does my doctor education uh, training programs that, that I have. So so it, it really just, it has to be something that I feel like I can make an impact. For those of you listening, if you don't know what my mission is, my mission in the world, uh, my ultimate impact mission is to, is to reach 100 million people because that's how many people suffer with forms of chronic autoimmune disease. So my, my goal is to reach 100 million people. And, and this is part of how I do that. So it's hard for me to reach that goal or even to maintain or try to even begin to achieve that goal if I'm, if I'm traveling everywhere to talk to small groups, 10, 15 people at a time. But that's why, you know, I've, I've just altered the, my speaking schedule to accommodate for groups, but, but larger groups. So um, again, if you've got, if you've got a special uh, group that you want to put together and have me come talk. I'm happy to do something like that. You just have to get in touch with my assistant Sally and and uh, and let us know what you have in mind, and we can we can see about arranging it. Uh, Lou, I started the ultra nutrients and really feel a difference. What else is different about this formula other than gluten free? Thanks. I'll tell you what's different about it, Lou. It's um, look, I de I designed it, the, it to have. The cofactor, so what a lot of people don't understand about vitamins and minerals is they're not all created equally. There are different forms of different vitamins. There are different uh, chelates of different minerals, and some of them work better, and some of them don't work better. And most products, like if you go over the counter like to the pharmacy and you buy like a, you know, a generic multivitamin or whatever it is, most, most companies, and we did the research analysis on this, on this over 15 years ago, um, most products have a raw cost of raw ingredients of about $0.08. Cents. And and when you tab in the you know the label and the bottle and everything else you know you might have a raw cost of about thirty two cents and then they sell it to you for seven or eight dollars so the markup on something like that is thousands and thousands of percent there's a lot of profit margin in it and and they have that huge profit margin but it's, it's unfortunately it's a poor product it's a horrible product it doesn't do a whole lot for somebody um, with ultra nutrients everything that we've sourced with ultra nutrients it, we've sourced it for a reason we've sourced it because it has a greater degree of absorption rate a better bioavailability and people with chronic illness some of the forms of the nutrients are more effective for aiding in detoxification so it's designed with intent and with purpose and that's most likely why you felt and noticed that type of difference thanks for for tuning in and chiming in and letting letting me know that you feel really good using it it makes it makes my day to know that the things that we're creating you know, within our foundation at Gluten Free Society or helping people get better. Again, we've got a lofty goal to reach 100 million people. So one at a time, but but I appreciate your feedback. Okay. 
So Christy Campos, um, this is the last question of the night. If rice is labeled gluten-free, is it okay to eat? No, there's no such thing as gluten-free rice. Now, tonight we talked all about corn, and we didn't really dive into rice and the research on rice. Um, and I'm going to answer your question very, very simply in that the, the, there is a gluten in rice. Rice, by concentration of gluten, has the lowest quantity of gluten than any other grain. So in essence, rice is lower in gluten than any other grain by concentration, but it still has a form of gluten in it. Or is or a xenon is the name of the form of gluten found in rice. And um and and it can do damage and it's known to create inflammatory problems in people with gluten sensitivity issues and it's been studied to do that. Aside from the fact that rice can contain high levels of arsenic, cadmium, and even in some studies now showing lead. So so those are non-gluten reasons why I would say you'd want to avoid eating rice. But, but from a gluten perspective, again, if you're truly gluten sensitive, if you've been diagnosed through adequately or properly through genetic testing, then you should not be eating rice, even if it says that it's gluten free, because there's no such thing as true gluten free rice. So great question. And with that last question, I'm going to end the show. Those of you who um, who enjoy the information and like the information that we're providing, make sure you're sharing this with somebody that, you know, again, my goal is to reach 100 million people and I can do that with your help and I can't do it without your help. So. Make sure if you've got friends or family members that have been diagnosed with celiac disease or that have uh, have been told they're gluten sensitive, that you share this vital, vital information with them because this could be the missing piece to their health puzzle. This could be the, the thing that gets them over the hump. This could be the thing that literally, and I mean this in all seriousness, that literally saves their life. And all it requires is that you share it to them. So highly recommend that you share this with your family members and friends. If you haven't read No Grain, No Pain, Go pick up a copy because that's a premise. That's a fundamental premise and, and starting point in your education to get the most out of every Monday night on the Pick Dr. Osborne Brain Show. So until next Monday, happy new year to you all. Have a great evening and we'll see you next week.